Now it's 1.30. It looks like we've got several who are joining us. Um, right now we'll give them just another minute or two to pop on. We need that might be something that, um, that might happen. So we will give everybody just a few minutes to uh, to hop on and to um, just try and help to cut out some of the background noise. Background noise is pretty bad. I see the background noise on this call is pretty bad. As people are logging in, if we are receiving a lot of background noise, I just want to make you aware that um, uh, Johnita, who's one of our project managers, is monitoring the background noise and uh, and will mute you if uh, if you don't mute yourself <laughs> to to try and help for let's keep that from being an issue. That's always a hard thing with with these type of webinars is that uh you know the background noise is, is always an issue so we are going to try and mitigate that with Johnita and her mute button so uh candace is also on here uh monitoring our chat and um helping with recordings and all this is recorded just um so everybody knows for future reference um so we'll get started in here just in here in a minute and uh, allow everybody just to I just see people continually popping on here. So we'll give it just another minute and then we'll get started. Thanks everyone. All right, y'all, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, we wanna thank everyone for joining us today. We're very excited about our first virtual summit. Um, this seems like it's going to become one of our new normals uh, moving forward is doing most everything virtually for the next year or so. So we're going to do our best to adapt as, as best we can and, um, and continue to move forward with providing you the information that, um, that you need and trying to connect and um, and help our businesses here in North Alabama. Oh, sorry, let me see if we can, there we go. Um, just a quick reminder, if you will, please make sure you mute your microphone. And if you have any questions, um, Candace is gonna be monitoring our chat. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to, um, to ask any questions over in the chat. And, um, if you forget to mute your microphone, Johnita is monitoring to make sure that we don't have any background noise. So uh, if you find yourself muted and you weren't already muted, that was probably Johnita. Uh, but we feel like that is something that's going to be very important for this to be successful. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. We've got a lot of good things on our agenda today. Uh, first and foremost, we have a industry panel with some of our local companies, which is really exciting for us. Um, they are going to be discussing um, how their companies are responding to COVID-19, how they're uh, adapting their businesses and their, um, and their product offerings, um, including contributions to North Alabama and, and beyond. So um, we're really excited to hear about that. 
And then as we're moving into this virtual environment, we thought it was very timely to have our partners at Transfer VR come on. And they just finished up a really neat project with Mazda Toyota Manufacturing. So they are gonna share their experiences of how to successfully implement um, virtual reality training. And so we're really excited to have them with us um, later on today. Um, so we're just gonna go ahead and get started. I wanna introduce our panel first and foremost here. Um, first, we have Ms. Amy Sturdivant, who is, with, who is uh, the Director of Business Recruitment for Hudson Alpha Institute of Biotechnology in Huntsville, Alabama. She is an economic development uh, professional in the life sciences. Amy recruits biotech entrepreneurs and companies from around the region and the world to the 152-acre Hudson Alpha campus in Huntsville. Uh, she supports over 40 companies there on the growing biotech campus of Cummings Research Park, and she serves on the Bio Alabama uh, Board as Vice Chair and the Southeast Life Sciences Board of Directors. Prior to her work in the bioscience industry, Amy worked in local government and was um, Director of Planning and Economic Development for the City of Madison for five years. And so we're so excited to have Amy here with us today. I wanna uh, make just a quick observation here. If you would like to see the panelists as they speak, as we go through the questions, uh, please choose the view uh, button at the top of your screen. It should most likely be at the top and uh, click who's talking. Um, and it should be at the top of your screen there. Next, we have Mr. Kirby Best, for, who is the CEO of On Point Manufacturing. Um, Kirby is also the president and CEO of PAAT Incorporated. Um, he is passionate about on-demand uh, computer-directed manufacturing. So um, they have a really neat um, concept for manufacturing there at On Point. They use software to automate every possible portion of the supply chain from the creator to the consumer. Uh, his focus is on creating value to the customer through fully customizable products, all produced on-demand. And he is also developing PAAT, which is a behind the scenes software company that allows information to flow freely from any platform by leveraging existing software and creating the payment and banking systems uh, needed to support further development. Prior to this, um, to his business career, Kirby uh, represented Canada in many world championships um, on a four man bobsled and a skiing team. Uh, where he skied on the biathlon, speed, and freestyle skiing teams for Canada. So that's really neat. And then our um, our last presenter here is going to be Mr. Gene Kleckler for DTPM. And uh, Gene is an entrepreneur who owns several businesses. He began his business career fighting drug abuse. He got into medical testing as an outgrowth of a DeKalb County nonprofit uh, drug treatment program he founded at the Life, the Family Life Center in 1993. His for-profit medical testing company, DTPM, was created to provide drug testing for the center and began doing testing for other similar drug treatment programs around the country nearly two decades ago. The business has grown to serve physician practices and drug courts by helping them to set up labs and to serve their own medical and drug testing. So we're really excited about hearing about how, um, how they've changed their operations to meet the COVID-19 crisis. Well, we'll just jump into our questions here. We'll start with um, Ms. Amy and we'll go through um, to Kirby and Jean as well. Uh, if you will, we're, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and um, we're going to give each person uh, just a little bit of time to uh, to respond and tell us about how uh, your company or organization is responding to these questions. So our first question, uh, this one will go for to Amy first. How has your company or organization directly been involved in the fight against COVID-19 through new products, processes, um, and other things? Sure, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so hopefully you can all hear me, but we have been involved in many ways because of the companies on our campus. We have over 40 biotech companies on the Hudson Alpha campus, which really means that we have lots of different 
people in that fight against COVID-19. And that has to do with um, the not just the, the treatment and the testing, but also a search for vaccines. So I just thought I would touch on a few of the companies at the Hudson Alpha campus in Huntsville who are in that. And one of the interesting things to note is that many of the companies on our campus have actually been expanding during this time, as you might imagine, because they're hiring temporary people as well as additional staff to work through that uptick. But they've been working through testing. So you may have heard on the news, Diatherix is a company that is doing tested for COVID-19. They're doing the testing that's going to tell you whether right now you have it or not. And uh, last I checked, they have done over 150,000 tests and they are doing more than 5,000 tests daily. So that's a main way that uh, one of the Hudson Alpha companies is involved. Then we also have another company that is working on understanding the immune system impacts of the disease. So they're actually working together, I repertoire with Hudson Alpha and the Huntsville Hospital System to get samples from the patients who have had COVID or have it currently and study their immune system reaction in hopes of developing a quick vaccine. Wow, that's wonderful to hear that um, that everybody's working so hard to towards that vaccine there. Um, Herbie, would you like to tell us uh, how your company has directly been involved with the, with the fight? Yeah, Stephanie, thank you very much. Thanks for allowing us to be part of this. I, I, I feel like I'm the dumb jock of the whole group, so uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here and great fun to be in North Alabama. Our, our little company is um, relatively new. Uh, we focused on um, high-end uh, women's wear, business dresses primarily, and um, when COVID-19 really started to hit in a serious way, um, there were a number of people around me that kept saying, we've got to get into masks, we've got to pivot this company. And, and I resisted. I, I will tell you that it was not my idea that uh, two of our designers just said, we've got to do something. And um, our next door neighbor said, came over and said, you, you've got to do it. So we we made the decision late Thursday night that we would change over the whole factory. And um, we thought about it on Friday and we moved everything and reconfigured our equipment on Saturday and we were in full production on Sunday. So we pivoted from making women's dresses. We do have a, a sub company that makes medical scrubs and, and lab coats and things like that. Um, but we had not made masks and uh, so by that Sunday, we had changed to masks, just cloth masks, not the um, the N95 mask. But uh, it was it was a lot of people were interested in them, and because the N95 masks were being um, uh, utilized by the top medical professionals, that everybody else needed something. So uh, we started making a lot of masks and. Uh, we then have now uh, pivoted once again into gowns, uh, a level one gown, and now we are on a level three gown. And um, we just got an order this morning for 25,000 more gowns. So it continues to grow um, the, the need for these uh, high-end gowns that are FDA certified. So, so that's how we've changed our company. And uh, I think the fun part is that we were able to do it that we made the decision to do it, we transformed and and got them out. So it, it's been it's been fun. That's wonderful to hear. Dean, Angie, how would you like to tell us um, about how your company's directly been involved with the fight? Absolutely. Um, I think I've got my microphone on there. Kirby, I may need some masks now that I find out that you are making these. Uh, uh, so our, our company, uh, as Candace described, we, we got into the laboratory business in 1993 and that's evolved over the years. And so we now develop and set up molecular laboratories throughout the United States. And so when this started in January, my team uh, got together and we, we decided we would develop a, a, a test for uh, COVID-19. 
by the end of January, we had the test developed and now it is FDA uh, cleared with the emergency use authorization. Uh, it runs in Tide Laboratory, uh, which is a subsidiary of DTPM. It's our research lab. And so it runs in Tide Laboratory in Fort Payne. Uh, and, um, and then also we've been setting this up in multiple labs throughout the United States. So as soon as we were able to get our assay approved and by the FDA for allowing us to place it in, in other laboratories, we began placing it. And that's actually, uh, we're, we're doing that weekly now. We continue to test at Tide on a, on a low basis. Um, the highest day we've had, I think is 2000 uh, results in a day. And for a small lab that, it, that previously, I, I would say the most we tested in a day was around 200. Uh, because well, our lab is not designed to be a reference laboratory. Our, our lab is designed to support our customer labs. And, uh, and so really not, not just testing the public. And so uh, we are testing a lot of uh, uh, local uh, North Alabama um, hospitals. We're with a lot of the small hospitals in our area. They're sending their uh, COVID-19 tests to us. And, uh, but we're currently focused on setting up laboratories. That's what we do. We set them up in physicians offices and uh, uh, just throughout uh, reference labs, large and small. So, um, so as far as um, uh, it's, it's been a bit of crazy time, it's, uh, it's uh, amazing that we've not seen anything like this in our, our company's history, but, uh, uh, but yeah, we're real, real um, honored to be able to do, do something to play a role in, uh, in testing. So, that's wonderful. Thank you, Jean. Uh, we're going to go back to Amy with our next question. And as I'm sitting here, I want to uh, apologize, Amy. I have uh, apparently spelled um, alpha incorrectly. I noticed that I, there's an F there instead of a PH. I'm not sure if autocorrect did that just uh, based on the insurance name or what, but I apologize for that. Um, Amy, um, do you foresee that your uh, new products and offerings are going to be produced long term moving forward? Well, we do. We see that um, the application of them will continue. It's really um, it depends on what happens next, as a lot of you know. But what we're seeing, for instance, is in one of our other companies that is a startup company that's on campus they have been actually working toward a product that would be a rapid infection detection system that could be deployed for instance um, for the warfighter or in an airport so they though they're not doing anything right now for covid are taking lessons from covid applying those to the future so that when the next virus or something like this happens again, their product will be more ready. So I would say very much in the biotech world, um, this is what it's all about. And they're moving forward with products or uh, platforms that work like this. So this has opened up the eyes and made sure that everyone's aware. The other thing to know about the sector of biotechnology right now and pharmaceuticals, you're probably hearing this also in the news, is that there's a lot of collaboration that may not have been happening all the time before, but it's really happening now. It's happening as much or more as you're hearing about it. So I think those are some of the lasting things that will happen from this, Stephanie. Wonderful, thank you, Amy. Kirby, how do you foresee that, um, that your newly developed products are going to be something that's going to, um, that you'll continue to produce on a long-term basis? Yeah, no, great question. The uh, the answer is uh, the masks are now being um, produced over in China, and we just can't compete against that. But the gowns we can, and uh, so we will continue to do those. And I think a lot of people should know that the gowns are all recyclable. And um, when these labs and the um, offices and hospitals are now doing their study, they realize that um, it's about a month and a half to two months and their break even occurs over the disposable ones and of course the environmental impact. So yes, we believe that the gowns will continue with our other medical products. So, yeah. That's wonderful. 
Do you, do you think that um, you'll continue um, as well with your newly developed product? Do you think it'll be something that you're going to continue to uh, produce long term as well? Um, yes, it, it, you know, in the last week or so, it sure does not look like COVID-19 is going anywhere. It looks like it's here to stay. I, I guess we'll find out as time goes on. But, uh, you know, previous to this, we had four other coronavirus assays that were in our upper respiratory panels. So coronavirus itself was not new to us. COVID-19 was. And so now we have five in, in our upper respiratory panel or our customers can just test for coronavirus if that's what they're looking for. But the majority of tests that go through our lab or any of these labs are negative. And so that's something that, you know, it does make sense to go ahead and test for, to find out what's wrong if we're being tested because we're sick. Now, if we've been tested because we were exposed to someone with coronavirus, well, maybe we only need to test for the coronavirus. So yes, we think it will, continue to be a part of our uh, upper respiratory panel. And we um, we also see it as, as a standalone if someone is just afraid of that. We've tested for some large companies that are say, going out to an oil rig, you know, uh, and they wanted to test before they put a person out on a oil rig like that. And so in those situations, they don't, they're not testing for uh, a possible infection, their test, you know, that they think they have, they're testing more as a preventative measure before they go out onto the oil rig. And uh, so we're, I think we'll see more things like that. So I think in that case is where we'll see COVID-19 tested alone as a standalone. Um, and then of course, we've had such an influx of either current labs wanting to add molecular testing in order to add COVID-19 or uh new startups uh and and we're really that's that's something that is is a big focus of ours is to see uh these in physicians offices and and um and you know and helping us to in the future as we deal with things like this or possibly a reoccurrence uh that uh, you know that's uh, a role we really want to play thank you gene Henry, uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about what you feel the biggest challenges have been for um, for your organization during the pandemic and, and how you've addressed them? Sure, this one's a little trickier. Since we are a, a research business campus, um, and that is really my role as an economic developer with our team on the Hudson Alpha campus, we have dealt with a lot of the issues that maybe your executive teams are dealing with on how do we uh, make sure that everyone who is working on campus or on site is safe and how do we make sure that anyone who has to work from home is able to do that to the best of their ability so i think those have been some of our challenges you all might find it a little bit surprising that most of the people that work for Hudson Alpha, which are about 200 plus people, most of whom are scientists working in labs, are working from home. So they're doing work from home and for a long time, uh, for about a four week period, no one was going actually to the campus from Hudson Alpha. They were working as much as they could from home. Um, some of you may have taken advantage of some of the federal offerings, and those are things that we encouraged the companies on campus to do as well. So, um, you know, balancing the need for the companies on our campus to still be on campus and be working was a challenge for us, but we worked through that. We've recently, just in the last few weeks, actually installed in two of the buildings the kind of kiosk temperature checks. So you can walk into that temperature check, get that done before you're going on. And we do have policies for wearing masks when on campus in common areas. So those are things that I know probably sound familiar to a lot of the people listening that those same challenges of how do we do this or how do we sit in our homes like we are now and uh, continue business. And we've done a lot of that kind of pivoting as well. So lots of lots of need lots of uh lots of work still going on and like i said expanding companies during this time as well that's great to hear and that is very interesting to hear that many of your scientists are working from home that that is very surprising 
Kirby, um, how what have been some of the challenges that um, that OnPoint has seen? Yeah. Um, so the the biggest challenge, of course, was safety. Um, we were very very concerned about it. I still am concerned. Um, I don't think I'm worried about the disease myself, but I'm petrified that I would be the one that might introduce it into this factory. Uh, unlike Amy, we didn't have the luxury of working at home. We have to. We have a system that has to be run with people, so a little more dangerous in terms of safety. So. We think we did everything that we possibly could. We uh, had a whole protocol developed of washing hands, and of course, everybody has their temperature taken, and we have questions that we ask, and um, just monitoring everybody, of course, social distancing, and the way we had designed this whole system, luckily, everybody was uh, about 10 feet apart from everybody else, so that worked out. That, that was not by design, that was by by luck. So I think that would have been the biggest issue that we faced. Um, little things reconfiguring. We went from probably under a thousand units a day to five thousand units a day, and so just the logistics of that uh, was a bit of a nightmare. And uh, a lot of these things didn't go through our normal traditional system. So there was a lot of um, um, spreadsheets and and billing invoicing that had to be done that way. And um, I think the the other thing was it did create um, a trickle down effect starting in China with equipment that went all the way through that we had trouble getting new equipment. And our biggest issue still today is hiring people. Um, we are looking for qualified seamstresses, sewers all the time. So those were our big issues, but safety above everything else. Of course. Mm -hmm. Dean, would you tell us a little bit about what your biggest challenges have been during the pandemic and how you've um, addressed those? Well, uh, I can kind of echo some of the things they've said, the safety issues and uh, and just getting everyone to buy into that. Uh, and I find actually more now, I think people are tired of it. <laughs> so, you know, it's been kind of difficult to you know, especially you start seeing the numbers pop up again and, and, you know, it's like, well, guys, we got to pull back, you know? And, and so anyway, so definitely safety. Um, as I said, the lab, our lab went from a, a, mostly a research lab that worked with our laboratory customers to boom 2000 specimens in a day. And for us, that was phenomenal. Uh, so that was, that was probably the most challenging and most stressful uh, part. I, I think I felt a little bit of what the grocery stores was feeling. You know, they were out of milk and bread and all this in the toilet paper. But, you know, we were on a much different side. But the stress and just, you know, uh, our supply supply chain, uh, we set up and have to have machines. So, you know, the machine, you know, begging people for machines, begging people for supplies. We were so fortunate that we never ran out. Uh, and still have not the entire time, but uh, goodness, it, it's, uh, you know, for us, a pipette tip or some of these little pieces of plastic that before you just took for granted that all of a sudden were not only gold uh, to us, but uh, they all of a sudden the price prices went up. And uh, so just, um, uh, you know, uh, they, they're right to the staff. Staff we've hired Oh gosh, in the lab, we've tripled the size of our lab staff, but it's not just bringing in the laboratory staff, it's also training them. So, uh, so we, it, it has been, I've seen it stress things we never thought would be stressed. Uh, it's made us better. I will t tell you that it's made us a stronger staff. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's brought up things that we had never seen before. So, um, you know, so we're, and I will one one last thing is working from home. Uh, yes, we we pushed a lot of people out, but our lab you have to come in to work in the lab. So so that we could not push out. But we we are we already had employees in nine states. We've got an office in Pennsylvania and one in Dallas and two in Fort Payne. And and then we have people in in all these states. Some of those already worked at home. So so there was we had a little experience with that, but all of a sudden in literally a week pushing out about 70 percent of our employees 
um, that that was um, that was extremely difficult. So uh, so yeah, we're learning a lot of lessons. I think we're all still learning and adapting as we as we move forward here for sure. Um, Amy, would you um, would you like to tell us are there any changes to your business or organization um, that have come as a result of the virus that have proven beneficial or a better way of doing things? Sure. Yeah, this has been interesting. I'm, I'm sure most of you have these kinds of experiences that we have at Hudson Alpha. So one of our changes is that we used to have a quarterly all hands meeting and we would have that standing in the atrium at Hudson Alpha. So if you can imagine 200 plus people standing there in the atrium trying to hear what was said. Well, of course, that meeting has changed just because we're not all standing there but we're all on a call a lot like this and we can see each other and we're doing that every Monday morning for about maybe 10 minutes. And I know that Dr. Rick Myers, who leads the Institute, has said a few times, I love seeing everyone this way and I, I'm pretty sure we want to keep doing it this way. So that's been a big change. And for those of you who aren't always working at home, and I should say some of the teams that we're sending in to Hudson Alpha are small teams that are only seeing that group and then a different group is working at a different time in the lab or in operations. So it's a way for everyone to see everyone that they're used to seeing and, you know, waving and smiling. And that's brought a lot of comfort, I think, to people, which we do need. We need some of that steadiness and comfort and seeing the faces of the people we're used to seeing. One other thing I'll mention is that we've used Slack, and this is a tool for kind of gathering communication. So a lot of our communication previously amongst Hudson Alpha was all through email. Now, if I need, or walking to the person's desk. So now when I need to walk and talk to somebody about how I'm gonna do this marketing piece, I actually do that on Slack. So they're not getting an email for me, we're having a communication and it might be me with one person or it might be me with three people. And if you haven't used that kind of tool, Slack or something like it, I encourage you to try it because our team has found it to be very, very useful to be able to kind of cordon off those different conversations that you're having with someone about a project and make it happen so that you can have that go along. Wonderful. Herbie, would you like to um, tell us, are there any changes to your business that you've seen as a result of the virus that have proven to be beneficial as well? Yeah, I think the, um, the first change was um, uh, the realization that our model worked and that we could pivot to something else very quickly. We, we've built the whole company on that, but we've been changing in fairly small increments from a dress to a skirt to a blouse and things like that, to all of a sudden change to a level three uh, medical gown was quite something and to change the whole company over. Uh, so that was great. I think on a, a sad but a positive note for us was the sense of urgency. We watched these horrific uh, pictures coming out of New York and New Jersey and what was happening with uh, the medical professionals up there and that gave us that sense of urgency that what we were doing was real and it was important and uh, so it was it was um, heartwarming for us to be sending product up there that we knew was getting used immediately so that would be our biggest change that's great Dean, are there um, any changes that you've seen um, in your business as a result of the virus that have proven to be a better way of doing things? Yes, I, I, what I mentioned a, a minute ago about working from home, um, we're definitely a lot better at that. And we're using um, tools like like this today, with like video chat. I, I do like the uh, uh, we've used Microsoft Teams and that works pretty good. We've used some others and and uh, we can even record them and that's been nice. Uh, what what uh, what uh, Amy was mentioning about meetings? Yes, we've gone to daily meetings in shorter. Uh, we're doing uh, we have to do a supply chain meeting now every day 
And it's because we, we got so close to running out of those supplies, we've had to really watch that. We've also, we've got better inventory control. That's something we didn't have to worry about before because we could always get it within, and we kind of knew the period of time. Well, when that changed, now we've set ourselves min, sales minimums. Uh, we've, we've had to educate ourselves on everything from do they have expiration dates because you got to be careful how much you order if it has an expiration date. And some of our products have expiration dates. So, so many different things that have made our business uh, stronger and we've educated ourselves. Um, we also, something kind of funny, we uh, in the laboratory, uh, again, us being, not being a reference lab, we pulled in a lot of our staff members that typically did not work in the lab. Now they were just, uh, you know, moving paper or they were, uh, you know, data entry, things of that nature. Uh, they didn't have the skills to test or to uh, work in the technical part of the lab, but it's been a, a great experience for our company because something I, I, I think it would have been good for us to do before is to have people, hey, go work in that department for a while. Go, you know, go learn what that department does. And so now people in our billing department truly understand what's going on in that lab. So, so it's been, it's been a real neat experience and uh, you know, there's been some really uh, good things come out of that. Wonderful way that, that I think everyone is continuously improving right now. Um, Y'all, we've got just about uh, three or four more minutes uh, left for our panel. I want to make sure that we're moving right along, but I would like to close this session um, by asking you if there's any advice that you would give our other companies and organizations in the region uh, based on what your company's efforts have been. Amy, starting with you, what, what advice would you have for, uh, for a company? Well, I, you know, I've thought about this. I don't know that I have great advice for any or all of you, but I would say that if you look in your trade journals, your trade publications or those of the communities that you're serving, you'll see those tips on trends, right? So there are trends that have already come out of everything that's been going on. And I think you can look to those a lot like what Kirby's talked about today is how you pivot and make sure that you take what you already do well and shift that to making sure that you're doing it well in new ways that are, are trending ways or are going to be in more demand today. So I think that's a fun thing to do. I kind of uh, enjoyed doing that, looking at some of the economic development and city planning uh, trade journals and talking about how design is going to change of our communities, our campuses, and our our spaces where we work, whether it's office or lab. So those are things to look at for me, but look at your own trade publications and see what they're saying the trends in your area are. And then you can and you know pivot from there and and blend those things into the things that you're offering and doing. That's wonderful advice. Harry, what advice would you have for other companies and organizations in the region? Boy. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I can give any advice, but um, it was really fun for us to watch the idea to, to pivot over to the masks and other things come from um, the floor level, uh, our designers and stuff who said, come on, we've got to do this. And, and the fact that we could do it, um, you know, there's a great American spirit. You, you study World War I and World War II and how the U.S. just changed overnight uh, some of the dramatic industries. And um, so just fun that we can do that. And it's just a mindset of saying, hey, we're going to do it and go out and do it. So it's, um, it's been an honor to work with some of these great minds. That's great. Gene, what uh, advice would you have for other companies in the area? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, that's a tough question. Uh, we've been such we've been in such a cocoon, uh, I guess, since this started. At the the only thing that's on my mind, I guess, and probably, I don't know that it relates to everyone here, is that we you know we don't believe uh this will be the last time we'll see something like this and even this one itself is is far probably from over so you know what we want to see is is not have the bottleneck we want to you know there's so many things that that uh 
that I guess concern us. The only thing though that we have any control over is is hopefully being able to see this uh, capability right there in a physician's office instead of instead of in uh, you know fewer labs throughout the United States. So yeah, I can't you know though I, I guess advice I don't have much, but that's that's what was on my mind is the role we played and and uh, we'd love to see that happening um, you know more throughout the United States, but definitely here in Alabama. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much um, for your efforts during this time and just for coming on here and being willing to share your experiences with us today. Um, I think it's very, I know I've learned a lot today and I think many of our, uh, our other companies and partners have probably learned a lot about, um, about some of the things that um, you all and other companies who are, are also throughout our region are doing to respond. So it's very eye opening for us. Um, thank you so much again. And we greatly appreciate it y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ronnie, I'm going to uh, switch over and make you our presenter now. And um, while we're getting that, uh, that changeover made here, um, just as soon as I get that over, I'll go ahead and introduce you all as our next speaker. All right, that change has been made and while and uh, while he is getting uh, his screen set up, I'm going to go ahead and uh, announce our uh, next presenter, who is uh, Mr. Barani Raja Kumar. Uh, he is the uh, CEO of Transfer VR. He was born in South India and moved uh, with his family to Florida and, and was fully bought into the American idea that if you get a worked hard, the sky's the limit for your dreams. Um, he started by earning uh, $5.25 an hour working at his first job at Wendy's. Uh, through a state program for high school students. He earned a full academic scholarship to the University of Florida and majored in finance. Next, he spent five years at a New York City investment bank. Uh, he chose to leave the financial services industry when he observed that not everyone gets an equal opportunity to have steady work and wanted to find a way to make a difference. He knew technology could help and pivoted to Carnegie Mellon University where he earned his MBA and was offered an opportunity to take the same classes as the PhD education researchers, which he excitedly accepted. In 2016, he was presented with the Outstanding Leader of the Year Award by the U.S. Distance Learning Association. In October 2017, he started Transfer VR using his understanding of how people learn uh, and what gets them excited about learning. Um, critically, what what kinds of skills they need to master to open up a pathway to career success. So we're really excited about learning more about what that looks like. Uh, with Barani today, we also have Joe Massaro, who is the business development, who is with business development for Transfer VR, and Mr. Mark Selby with Mazda Toyota Manufacturing. He is the plant man or the paint manager there. I'm sorry, the paint manager. Uh, there in um, in Huntsville, Alabama, and we're really excited to hear about what their um, experiences have been with working uh, in this virtual environment with Transfer VR. So I'm going to turn it over to y'all. Thank you so much. Stephanie, thanks for that uh, um, overly generous uh, introduction. Um, really appreciate you um, inviting us to to kind of share what we've been working on. So um, just as a, a quick background. Um, like Stephanie mentioned, my name is Barani Roger Kumar, and um, we're joined, uh, we're, you know, have a special guest here, uh, Mark Selby from Mazda Toyota Manufacturing. And all of this actually came about um, through our relationship with AIDT. Um, so they've been uh, just incredible at um, kind of explaining where this technology that we're going to share with you can fit. Um, in the manufacturing industry in, in, in Alabama. So um, we can just jump right into this. Um, 
you know, Mark is probably the best person to talk about uh, the value of, um, of uh, this type of training. And of course, it kind of comes in this very timely manner with COVID, you know, people needing to have the ability to train remotely and to access um, high quality experiences remotely. So I'm gonna actually turn it over to Mark and just kind of begin uh, by asking him, uh, Mark, um, how do you and AIDT actually work together? Well, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Of course, my name is Mark Selby, and I am the paint manager here for the Apollo line. So the Apollo line is the Toyota side of the business. And um, I started here in uh, uh, April of last year. Um, prior to that, I have 25 years of experience uh, in paint and body and assembly at um, Mercedes, Ford, and also had a stint at Faraday Future and EV Company in California. So um, also with my introduction, I like to give my safety commitment and uh, my commitment is to promote a safe work environment. So um, Bernie, your question about how did we uh, get involved with RTP? So um, one of the key uh, mission statements from RTP is to uh, promote a technically uh, trained and highly skilled and educated workforce. So for us being a new uh, company, uh, a new industry to the Huntsville area, um, building uh, cars, this was a great uh, foundation uh, to uh, start that relationship with RTP. So uh, collaborating with those guys, and uh, it was just the right thing to do, being here local and partnering with a company that could uh, help us with uh, uh, extensive and, and, uh, and uh, continuous learning was, was just a smart uh, uh, first step for MTM here in the area. Perfect. And, um... You know, the, the, as everyone on this uh, call knows, uh, training is not inexpensive. Um, companies spend um, a lot of money on training and a lot of money has gone into uh, making RTP what it is. And one of the things that we try to do as a company is bottle up, um, create that lightning in a bottle, capture it so that it can be provided to uh, folks who may not be within driving uh, distance of you know such an incredible state-of-the-art facility um so mark i guess one of the questions that might be useful uh answering is what were some of your biggest training challenges what were the issues that you were trying to solve and you know why were you even considering um virtual reality training simulations as a potential solution yeah, so first, uh, MTM will be the first uh, company here uh, stateside on what we call the NAMC, which is a uh, North America Motors here for Toyota. We are using a, the FANUC technology first. So uh, being able to have a, a, a source to train was one of the key factors. So, uh, we have other training uh, that's that's uh, that can be provided for us, but at what cost and uh, and what can we do locally in order to uh, uh, give our team members the uh, um, a training that they need? So uh, looking at okay, going out of state and uh, traveling to Phoenix, the cost of that was very extensive and we have a number of team members to train. So just uh, looking at that uh, superficially, uh, 85, 86 people to train at $4,000 per person is, is very expensive. So um, looking at it from a cost standpoint, it's not a feasible uh, um, or smart way to run your business. Um, so uh, using a transfer and uh, using a virtual reality, uh, we uh, partnered with you guys and uh, created some uh, simulations around the uh, uh, FANUC robots and 
was we were able to provide that uh, uh, simulation to all of our members. And for those who um, have not had a chance to see what what that might look like, um, I am going to just paste this video here in the chat box. So if you have access to the chat, you can click on that link and check out um, a that YouTube video at your at your leisure. Um, and what you're going to see is this video right here. So I've pasted the link in the chat. So if you open that up, you can open up a separate window and, and, and check out that video. It'll work much better than if we try to show the video through this uh, screen sharing app. Um, but Mark, while you know, while folks are kind of watching that video, maybe you could share with them um, how exactly did this training simulation solve your your um, your problems? How did it work, and and what did it do for you exactly? Well, we can start kind of from the beginning and the inception, right? So uh, we had the opportunity to um, review your um, simulation that you had to, with the AIDT. And once we reviewed that, we saw some validity in that process. And um, we then partnered with you and FANIC and AIDT in order to uh, uh, form a strategy around, you know, what makes sense? What's, what can we do that's that's effective and that's simple and is very safe, right? So um, we formed that strategy. Uh, we did our storyboard, storyboard reviews and, uh, and then decided you know, these key uh, modules, uh, we should start with these in order to give our team members some exposure to FANIC robots. So it's three or four very, very key, very simple uh, uh, apps that were easy to create, but also gave some lifelike uh, simulations for the team members to um, to train and 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 understand uh, some of the basic uh, troubleshooting that needs to be done with the uh, FANIC robots. Thanks, Mark. And so uh, just a reminder to actually see what Mark is talking about, um, all you have to do is open up your chat box window and there is a, a, a YouTube link there to a video and you will be able to actually see what, what Mark is talking about. Now, um, I am changing slides, but I'm, I'm actually not sure if you are seeing that. Um, are you seeing my new slides as I change them? Uh, So you're still on the uh, the simulation slide. Uh, That's um, right. With the video. Yep. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure you were seeing that. So okay. um, I've now just switched slides here, just to give everyone um, kind of a, a bit of the background on how it works. So a, as Mark was saying, um, what Mazda Toyota was really looking for was to simulate the experience of being in a paint booth, booth, um, being in a paint booth and troubleshooting. Um, a paint robot. So here in the top right box, you can see a real paint booth um, and you see the robotic arm here. Uh, and what we did is we recreated that for Mazda Toyota. And when trainees would put on the headset, they would experience what you see in that video in the link. And um, one of the, the benefits, of course, like Mark was saying, it's, it's very expensive to provide some of this training to folks. But when you can create a hands-on training simulation that has a digital coach um, that walks you through uh, the troubleshooting process, it can dramatically reduce uh, the cost. For example, uh, it will reduce the amount of time required to travel. It might cut out a lot of travel. Um, the access to the machines, you know, Right now, if you have one machine, you're gonna to have to do a rotation. Uh, if you have this simulation type of environment, you can have dozens of people doing the training at the same time. So it becomes a little bit more efficient that way as well. Um, so Mark, when you uh, first put on the headset, um, what was your 
experience like? What what did you feel that this type of training um, was useful for? How did it compare to the normal type of training that, that was being done before in the past? Oh, the very first time I put the headset on, it was like, wow, this looks like a spray booth. So it was amazing the amount of detail and uh, real world uh, uh, application that you could feel once you put your headset on. And then using your hand controllers, how uh, you were actually manipulating your hands with your hand with the hand controllers. Uh, it was a very, very uh, surreal feeling of, okay, I am actually in a paint booth and actually performing tasks inside that booth. So, um, you know, for myself, it was very rewarding. And uh, also for the, the team members, they were very, very uh, excited. So it, it increased their uh, learning capability because they were excited to learn because this was new, this was, this was different. And it it uh, it gained their uh, um, attention, and it was uh, retaining their attention because of the level of 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 uh, immersive learning that you have when you're in a, a virtual reality. Great. Um, so one of the really big things I think that was important. Um, Mark for your, for your, for you and your team was being able to improve the efficiency of troubleshooting, making sure that um, folks who were going through the training could actually improve the time in which um, they could troubleshoot a robot. You know, normally for everybody else on the call, normally what happens is that um, if you're learning this for the first time, you, you may learn through trial by fire, you know, on the job, something happens to the robot, you've got to figure out how to fix it in real time. And that can that can lead to um, very high costs. And so, doing it in the simulation-based environment will help you uh, learn those troubleshooting skills without, you know, a significant cost to the business. But, um, you know, Mark, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what were the gains that uh, you and your team experienced, and um, if this kind of lived up to your expectations. Beside the the cool factor and and the enjoyability factor that it sounds like you're saying your team experience like it sounded like there was also impact to your your business as well the bottom line yeah absolutely so this slide actually shows uh, uh pre and post testing of the uh learning from before the simulation and after the simulation and these were real world uh um faults from fanic automation so the team members were able to learn with the virtual coach and you could see that uh, from one sim to the next pre and post tests 60 percent reduction so when you're looking at the uh, mean time to fit between failure and mean time uh between uh failure you can now see that this adds value so for for team members that have have uh, that are new that have never uh, been in a paint booth, never experienced robotics, you can um, see that the reduction is for members that have had no prior experience. So it is very, uh, a very real benefit and uh, it can be measured as that benefit. Great, thank you. Um, so it, it, it sounds like, you know, A, it's a, there's uh, an enjoyability factor, but B, there's a real ROI to the business, which I think is obviously, if there's no ROI, then why would anyone do this? Um, so it, it sounds like those two objectives were, were met, but more importantly, it was you know, solving a, a real problem that, that you had. Um, here are, just for, for the folks um, in the meeting, here are just a couple of quotes of folks who went through the training. Um, so from, from their perspective, the training, as Mark was saying earlier, um, it felt real. So it's unlike um, a video lecture where you're watching somebody else do it. When you put on the headset, uh, you are actually physically going through the tasks as you would in real life, or at least it feels like that. And again, 
for those who might have joined a little bit later, you can actually see a video of that. There's a video uh, in the, in the in the chat link, kind of describing that. Um, Mark, I think one of the things that was really interesting about the way you and your team at Mazda Toyota Manufacturing used the program is you found a completely different um, use case. And I just want to quickly state up front that these photos were taken pre-COVID. So we've been yes. working with um, AIDT and Mazda Toyota uh, for over a year now. So normally uh, today, you know, folks aren't standing as as close together as you see in these pictures. Um, so just want to put that out there that everyone's following the rules. These pictures are pre-COVID. But um, you know, Mark, I think what what you and your team have have done has gone kind of gone above and beyond like the traditional uh, training use case. And if you could just share a little bit about how um, these simulations are used, you know, outside of the regular training facility, that might be interesting as well. Yeah, so we um, had a train to trainer session on our first very first simulation. So we have four uh, trainers that uh, were uh, assigned to train our members as they um, uh, uh, use the simulation here at the uh, at the uh, uh, RTP, and two of our trainers in the bottom right corner are two of our group leaders, and the, the, their involvement is twofold. We wanted those two gentlemen to be involved because of their uh, their experiences and how uh, both of those gentlemen um, joined the automotive industry as team members are um, young kid, young children right out of high school. So both those guys joined the organization out of high school. So we felt that they could really relate to the uh, uh, high school kids and, and, and have them involved. Um, and now they can really talk to someone that they can relate to. So those guys, it's, um, these two gentlemen specifically, um, they're very, very good with team members and they're very good with um, with uh, children and explaining um, the necessary uh, um, first training and how you train safely and understanding our um, zones, uh, which is set up uh, both electronically and physically. So we wanna make sure that all members are safe before they uh, conduct this training. And these two gentlemen are, are two top-notch uh, trainers for uh, MTM. And uh, for us, being out in the community is definitely uh, the right thing to do as well. So we have to have a community involvement in order to um, have um, team members join the organization. So if you're not out participating, and um, joining these venues and and giving back to the communities and they can see okay these are what these guys are doing hey this could be something that i would like to do so we recognize that all um high school um, kids may or may not go to college so we want to promote a a a, a positive um culture a positive um um how do I say, a positive uh, picture in the community and say that you can come here and learn a craft. You can come here and learn a trade and you can also be uh, um, successful within Mazda Toyota. So we've done several of the um, career fairs, um, three, and one of the career fairs, uh, actually two of the career fairs have started a partnership between um, the uh, uh, two entities, one's at Morgan County and one is at, uh, at Limestone County. So with that, um, we uh, visit and, uh, and all of our members take the opportunity to come and talk to the high school um, kids. And, and, and from their standpoint, give them some motivation, give them some uh, uh, real life experiences and ask questions and have them involved to say, hey, you have someone that you can reach out to um, 
to help you be successful. So we used um, our simulations as well to make it fun. So the kids were very, very engaged and very excited to uh, participate. So I just want to highlight, since you know we work with folks all around the country, um, what Mark just described and, and how Mazda Toyota is using this is by far one of the most innovative approaches. You know, they're not just using it with folks that um, have already been hired, but now they're taking the training uh, that they actually use with their employees and they're giving it, they're putting it right into the hands of high school students. Um, and that's that's really powerful because a lot of these students uh, may not they don't actually know what goes on in 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 these um, compounds and when they get the hands on experience it's just a huge confidence booster as as Mark was saying and so we've got some great um, educators on, on the call with us today as well um, who you know it'd be great to kind of get their input as, as they. Uh, we're going to wrap things up here. We'd love to get their input on, on how this might fit in the overall education system. But building that classroom to career pipeline is a humongous mission of, of transfer. Um, there's going to be um, an announcement, um, uh, an initiative that uh, that we'll be making with with um, some other the key players in in the state next month. And so we're kind of really we're really proud about how uh, Mazda Toyota has been very innovative in taking this training solution and making it much more than, than uh, your typical training solution, using it as a way to uh, inspire the next generation of, uh, of folks in manufacturing. And this is Scott at MTM also. I, I'd love to make a comment on that last slide. I was actually at that training event or recruiting event and um, it was amazing. So I don't think we could understate this enough. But sometimes it's hard to recruit in manufacturing, which we're in manufacturing, and a lot of students don't understand what that is. And how high tech it is now. And uh, it's amazing to be able to see, you know, them being drawn in and understanding the things that they can do in our industry, even from just a standard production type job in the beginning. So it was a huge draw. And, uh, very positive and we look forward to this in the future. Thanks, Scott, and I really appreciate that. And one of the things that I forgot to, to mention up front um, in the beginning, you had mentioned, you know, AIDT was was uh, had kind of helped facilitate this this whole relationship. So we were working with Christy Bain from AIDT and Scott Russo um, from Mazda Toyota, who you just heard from, um, uh, was one of the key players in helping arrange all this. So there are a lot of people behind uh, the scenes. Um, and so Mark, while Mark and I were kind of nominated to share this story, there are a lot of people that helped make it happen. Um, so thank you, Scott, for sharing that. So I'm gonna zoom past this stuff. Um, long story short, we're helping um, companies in the community uh, with pre-employment training and, and creating that classroom to career pipeline. Um, things that we do are very data-driven, hands-on, and like we spoke about, there is a digital coach to make sure that the trainees um, get that just-in-time coaching so they can master the skills that employers uh, require to, to get hired. Um, and uh, I'm gonna skip here to the end because I wanted to, if there is time, Stephanie, I don't know if there's time, just open it up for, for any questions of, for folks who wanna ask a question to Mark or, or myself. Ronnie. So just a little bit of time. So um, if you'd like, we can take uh, maybe the next five minutes. And if uh, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to give you that time to, to answer any of those questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Jimmy Hull, thank you for the shout out. I see that comment. Um, and Jimmy, congratulations on uh, on your, your new role um, as a state director for Career Tech. Um, you know, maybe maybe you since you know we're all from industry that have been talking here, Jimmy. If you wouldn't mind just sharing your 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 two cents on what you saw today and how this might impact the education sector. Oh, are you on mute? Okay, I think I'm on now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, 
And Jim, yeah, you, you might just introduce yourself. I don't know if everybody everybody knows you, but it'd be great to. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'm Jimmy news. Hall. I am formerly career tech director in Elmore County, recently appointed state assistant superintendent for career and technical education and uh, workforce development for the state of Alabama. Uh, effective, I'll start July 1, but I'm already beginning to have some preliminary meetings and getting some things lined up. So uh, we had Barani and his group down for our, our Career Tech Directors Conference last spring in April at Perdido. Well, not this past spring, but I guess it was 2019. And um, got a great response to the product. A lot of directors are really interested. We see it as a way um, to introduce students at a, at a younger age to, you know, training techniques, different kinds of tools and opportunities that we may not be able to purchase across the board, but it would still give students an opportunity to explore uh, different training methods, different tools, different techniques, different reasons why we do the things that we do, um, where there might be a lack of access to, um, you know, to see certain things uh, around the state. So uh, I plan to continue to talk to Barani about the, the product they've got. I think it's a great program. Um, he does a great job. And I think there are some ways that we can use this in K-12, especially moving forward with the, uh, you know, virtual learning being a, a major component of what we're going to be doing moving forward. I think that this could play a role in helping us, um, you know, get students experience in different kinds of training. Hey, Jimmy, I just got to ask you one question. How uh, I, I've burned up the road quite a bit in Alabama. How long is that drive from Elmore County to Robotics Technology Park in Huntsville? I'm going to say that's close to three hours, I believe. Um, I've made that trip a few times and I think it's about three hours from, you know, I, I, I live in slap out Alabama. So from slap out to Huntsville, that's about three hours. Well, there you go. And I think that's one of the most powerful things that we can, um, that we enjoy doing in Alabama is working with uh, industry, you know, like Mazda Toyota and with educators like Jimmy to try to bridge that gap because Alabama is a huge state. There's a lot of land to drive. And um, if we can through this, simulation-based um, experience expose a lot more students to the awesome jobs in, in manufacturing. Um, uh, I think that'll help a lot of young folks get get clued in and keyed in on, on the opportunity that you, that, that you guys are providing. So um, right, exactly. thank you. Mm -hmm. So thank you everyone for giving us the time to, to share um, what, what's going on in, in Huntsville and, and, and with Mazda Toyota. Thank you, Barani and, and Mark and Joe and Scott for your comments there. And Jimmy, we're looking forward to working with you here in North Alabama. Um, we'll be reaching out to you soon and we can't wait to get started um, moving in, in the right direction with you. So um, with all that being said, um, Barani, can I move it back over to uh, Yep, let me just figure out how to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> I've got it here. I think I. I sure do. Wonderful. Oh, I just wanted to give you um, a quick update about a really exciting thing that um, we've got going on here in North Alabama. Um, in mid July, we're looking at the 14th, 15th, and 16th. Um, we're going to be working with um, the Huntsville Madison Chamber of Commerce, along with all of our EDAs throughout the region, community colleges, career centers, um, and chambers and other partners to put on um, Upwards Career Career and Training Fair. Um, we're really excited about this being a regional virtual event to connect uh, job seekers. Um, with the companies who are looking to hire as well as potential um, trainees to uh, the training that's out there right now. So uh, now is a good time for for uh, those who are dislocated to um, be thinking about career changes and things like that. We've got lots of opportunities, uh, many of them at no cost to those who are currently dislocated and a lot of those who are that are uh, at no cost to the public. So we want to make sure that um, people know about those training programs and that um, we're connecting them with the jobs that are available as well. It is our, um, it's our hope that we would always have um, them working as well as continuing through training um, simultaneously. 
So um, we're hoping to make some really great connections there. Um, we're looking forward to the first event, like I said, um, in mid-July, and we're hoping to continue these events, um, hopefully on a monthly basis moving forward until our unemployment uh, rates get a little bit lower and we're, we're coming um, out of the, the COVID crisis. So we want to continue to make those connections and um, look forward to that and, and definitely thank the Huntsville Madison Chamber for um, their generosity and in, in helping to uh, get this created and, and up and running and, and hosting it for us. Um, and our partners have been so wonderful to, uh, to jump right on board and, um, and work with us on this. The URL for this, I'm sorry, I meant to put that on there, is upwardsalabama.com. And it will be a place where they can go and, um, and see the information. But during the actual events, there will be opportunities for uh, live chats and things like that with the companies for them to connect with the companies and the training providers. So we're, we're really excited about it and we're looking forward to the, the possibilities that it's going to hold for our region. Um, so I just want to make you aware that that's going to be coming up. We're looking at um, it going live hopefully sometimes next week. And um, after that, we're looking at um, probably two weeks from now, we'll be sending out all the promotional information and we just love for all of our partners to, if you're a business and industry, please sign up and be, uh, be involved. And uh, if you're one of our partners who can share with, um, with your, um, with your groups, please, please do so. We want to make sure we're getting the word out. And we're connecting as many people as possible to the jobs that are available here in our region. So that's just one really exciting thing that we've got going on. I wanted to make you all aware of it. We've got lots of other things that are going on. Most of you should be receiving our weekly wrap ups. If you're not, and you would like to, please let us know. You can find our contact information as well as um, pretty much everything that we've got going on. Um, you can get connected there at uh, NorthAlabamaWorks.com. Um, I also encourage you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter as uh, and we're constantly posting uh, good things that are going on throughout the region and resources and, and other things. So um, just stay connected as we go through this. We hope to do some more, um, some more events as we move forward, some more especially um, targeted events. So we'll do some for business and industry, many for our partners and things like that uh, as we move forward. I did forget to, um, to mention that the Upwards Alabama Job Fair will um, be at no cost. So that's really exciting as well. So it's no cost to our business and industry or the participants to, um, to join and be a part of. So um, we're really excited about that and appreciate the Huntsville Madison Chamber for, um, for making that available as well. So with all of that being said, are there any questions or, or any comments before we, before we say goodbye for the afternoon? I'm sorry, can you tell me what the date was again for the Upward Job Fair? Yes, ma'am. Um, we are going to be testing it this next week, but the um, the date that we're pushing for is going to be the 14th, 15th, and 16th of July. All right, everyone. Well, um, if there's not anything else, we hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all for joining in with us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.